Welcome to the quantum realm, a place where the impossible thrives. Sci-fi fans and explorers, this is your gateway. We're diving into the unknown. Hit subscribe and join the mind-bending journey. The briefing chamber on Zyger Prime pulsed with an intensity I'd never quite experienced. Sure, as an elite member of the shapeshifting core, I'd seen my share of high-stake missions outlined in this sterile room, but there was a weight to today's proceedings that felt heavier than our planet's dense atmosphere. They called me Zyrth, at least that's the sonic pattern I'd been responding to since my first molting cycle. I took pride in my chameleon-like abilities, the way I could contort my form from the bulbous, multi-limbed Zygorian standard to, well, just about anything with a discernible biomass. I was an interstellar artist with my own skin and bones as the medium. Grand Commander Orlix's booming voice cut through the murmurs of my fellow shapeshifters, all of us assembled in various humanoid guises for the sake of familiarity. As you are aware, our ongoing analysis of the Blue Planet, designated Earth Dash has revealed a curious anomaly. A holographic projection of Earth shimmered into the center of the chamber. As always, I felt a tinge of alien disgust at its nauseatingly bright colors, the excessive amounts of water swamping its surface. It was like looking at an overripe nalt fruit, both visually repulsive and faintly intriguing. Intel points to a phenomenon native to this world, one our universal translators identify as food, Orlix continued. Despite its primitive nature, Earth appears capable of producing inexplicably complex and diverse substances its dominant species uses for sustenance they claim it can elicit a sensation known as pleasure. The notion was almost laughable. We, as Zygorians, drew our energy directly from the photonic radiation of our twin suns. Any concept of consuming something for reasons other than cellular replication was foreign. Orlix's stern visage took on a rare hint of amusement. I understand your skepticism, Zyrth. I felt much the same way when first reviewing the reports. However, his voice lowered, we have reason to believe that if harnessed properly, this food could hold extraordinary potential as a form of leverage. Now that got my attention. All six of my eyes narrowed. Leverage was our most potent weapon. It wasn't brute force that maintained Zygorian dominance throughout the quadrant, but our insidious ability to infiltrate, mimic, and manipulate less advanced civilizations into bending to our will. Your mission, Zyrth, is infiltration. You are to travel to Earth, assuming the form of its native life forms. Locate the most prominent sources of this food. Learn how it is made, how it affects the Earthlings. Most importantly, determine how it can be weaponized. The room seemed to distort slightly, the air shimmering in a way that wasn't the holographic display. Was it me, or was it the concept? This mission felt different. Not just dangerous, but oddly. Tantalizing. Any questions? Orlix's eyes, bulbous and multifaceted, bored into mine from across the room. I hesitated only a moment. My training demanded obedience, a total dedication to the mission. Yet, something about this bizarre assignment triggered a curiosity I'd never quite felt before. Commander, with the utmost respect, why send a shapeshifter? Our surveillance drones have infiltrated their communications networks. They possess what they call an internet dash a vast repository of knowledge. Could we not gain most of this information remotely? A few suppressed snickers bubbled forth from the surrounding shapeshifters. To question the Grand Commander. It bordered on sacrilege. Yet, Orlix didn't bristle. His voice remained even. You raise a valid point, Zyrth. Indeed, we have already gleaned a significant amount of data from there. Internet. He paused, tendrils beneath his chin twitching with mild agitation, a tell I'd learned to read over my molting cycles. But textual information lacks nuance. Recipes, techniques, the rituals surrounding this food. Much of it resides in the realm of experience. Their sensory networks record and transmit things our drones cannot easily decipher. You require a taste. I blurted, and immediately regretted the undignified word choice. Orlix's tendrils gave a twitch that could almost be interpreted as a nod. In essence, yes. You are our most adaptive shapeshifter, Zyrth. Capable not merely of external mimicry, but internal replication of organs down to the cellular level. We need you on the ground. We need you to become one of them. My final preparations took place in a sterilized lab, the technicians more akin to mechanics than medics. I underwent a series of painful molecular adjustments, every inch of my Zygorian physiology meticulously tweaked to accommodate the rigors of an alien digestive system. It was humiliating, a fundamental violation of the shapeshifter's ability to dictate one's own form. 
But the mission, the promise of that leverage, it fueled my endurance. Then, it was time. The transport vessel was nothing more than a glorified interplanetary projectile, designed to hurtle me across the cosmic void toward the blue planet. Strapped into a form-fitting cradle, I entered a forced hibernation state. Dreams, or the closest I could come to them, were a jumbled mess of swirling colors, foreign smells, and a persistent, gnawing sensation I couldn't place. My awakening was less than graceful. My body, no longer held in stasis, reacted violently to the Earth's gravity. I ejected a foul-smelling liquid I could only assume was the Zygorian equivalent of vomit and thrashed against my restraints until sheer exhaustion claimed me. When I regained coherency, it was to the sight of a stark white ceiling, the sounds of chirping electronics, and the disconcerting sensation of softness. I was on a bed. Easy now, easy. A voice registered, smooth and lilting. Female? I wasn't sure. My auditory receptors were still realigning themselves to this planet's particular atmospheric composition. Forcing my eyes to focus, I saw the source of the voice. A humanoid. Female. Dressed in pale blue, her hair pulled back in a strange knot. She held a small device that emitted bursts of light, then made a series of odd notations on a flat, rectangular surface. Can you understand me? She asked, slower this time, her words more clearly defined. Instinct kicked in. I had landed near a populated area, my disguise required immediate activation. Mimicking human vocal patterns had been drilled into me, the cadence and contractions painstakingly practiced. Ye. Yes, I rasped, clearing my simulated throat. My voice felt rough, unfamiliar. Wonderful. She smiled with a flash of white teeth. You gave us quite a scare. We found you collapsed out in the field. Name's Sarah. I'm a nurse. Nurse. Healer? This was useful. Less suspicion directed toward those who mended the sick. I decided to play the part of a disoriented traveler. W.H. Where am I? You're in a hospital in a little town called Willow Creek, Sarah explained. Do you remember who you are? Where you came from? The truth ward with the mission protocol? Zyrth, Zygorian shapeshifter? It wouldn't do. Humans were a primitive race, easily fooled by simple stories. I, don't recall, I lied, wincing to add a touch of vulnerability. My head, it hurts. Sarah clucked sympathetically. Well, that's to be expected after the dehydration you suffered. You're lucky a local farmer stumbled across you. Now, just rest. I'll have the doctor come see you shortly. With that, she was gone, the strange chirping of machines and her soft footfalls providing a discomforting soundtrack to my alien thoughts. My mission remained paramount, but something about this situation. It felt off. I hadn't anticipated such direct, unguarded contact with an earthling so soon after arrival. The doctor, as it turned out, was a garrulous older man named Howard. He prodded, poked, and shined lights into my replicated human eyes. I endured his clinical examination, all the while filing away every detail of his appearance, the round belly, thinning gray hair, the creases in his pale skin. This, apparently, was what earthlings looked like when aged. And then came the twist I never saw coming. As the examination concluded, Dr. Howard fixed me with a kindly smile and said, you can relax now. Sarah mentioned you don't remember much. That's perfectly normal in cases like yours. Cases like. I echoed, playing the part of the confused amnesiac perfectly. He patted my shoulder with a surprisingly gentle touch. You have a mild concussion, he said. Probably a bit of temporary memory loss associated with it. Don't worry, it should return within a few days. While you're here, just follow the nurse's instructions and get plenty of rest. And with that casual diagnosis, the plot thickened from simple infiltration to something potentially more complex. Or was this an elaborate human ruse? A test to see if I was truly what I claimed to be? I decided to trust my instincts. After all, a genuine case of amnesia would be the best cover I could hope for. The hospital at Willow Creek was an exercise in controlled chaos. White-clad figures zipped along pristine corridors, the squeak of their shoes strangely melodic on the polished floors. My human ears seemed to amplify every sound, the beeps, the whooshes, the murmured conversations filtering through my room's half-open door. But beneath it all was a steady undercurrent of something that snagged at my alien senses, the faintest rhythmic pulse, a series of thumps like distant drumming. My human guise, while physically convincing on the outside, offered some unexpected limitations. 
During a particularly boring stretch as I awaited yet another meal, earthlings seemed obsessed with feeding their sick, I decided to experiment. Closing my simulated eyes, I reached inward, back toward the latent core of my Zygorian form. To my astonishment, it responded with a sluggish ripple of energy. I extended a tendril of consciousness, a single exploratory filament snaking outward. The world around me distorted. My heightened perception overlaid the hospital's sterile beiges and whites with an explosion of color. Heat signatures painted bodies in shades of red and orange, even through walls. Each individual carried a unique sonic echo, from the nurse's chiming bangles to the doctor's slightly wheezy breath. Among it all pulsed that persistent drumming. Its source lay behind multiple layers of walls, a nexus of activity radiating outwards. Curiosity surged through me, an unfamiliar emotion but a potent one. With careful focus, I honed in on that rhythm, letting it seep into my Zygorian essence. The revelation burst through me like a synaptic supernova. That drumming, that incessant pulse. It was the core beat of countless hearts. I was sensing the combined life force of the very beings I was sent to investigate. A thrill shot through me, it was dizzying, almost sensual. Hello. Mister. Um. A young nurse, clipboard in hand, startled me. Her eyes, the color of the Earth's oceans, widened. Are you? All right? You look like you've seen a ghost. Snapping back into my human form, I cleared my fabricated throat. Apologies. Just. A bit lightheaded, I lied smoothly. I'd need to be more careful about exploring these strange new senses. I was assigned a name, John Doe, a conveniently anonymous placeholder for my feigned amnesia. The days blurred in a haze of bland food, more prodding by medical staff, and the occasional well-meaning attempt at drawing out my lost memories. Humans, I quickly learned, were uncomfortable with the unknown. Despite their kindness, there was an undercurrent of wary suspicion lurking behind their smiles, likely due to my unusual circumstances. Yet, something held them back. Perhaps it was my genuine confusion, a side effect of my Zygorian physiology struggling to adjust to the limitations of the human form. Whatever the reason, the intense scrutiny I'd expected hadn't materialized. Instead, I became a curiosity, a puzzle for the hospital staff to ponder during their breaks. One evening, as the low hum of machinery lulled me towards a semblance of sleep, I heard it, the sound of music. Faint at first, then swelling, carried down the hallway on an invisible breeze. It was unlike any sonic pattern I'd encountered before, a whirlwind of emotions translated into notes. There was sorrow there, and joy, and something else I couldn't define, a kind of yearning. On impulse, guided by both curiosity and the gnawing emptiness within my simulated stomach, I left my bed. The hospital corridor stretched before me, bathed in the sickly blue glow of emergency lights. My oversized hospital gown billowed around me with comical awkwardness, but I didn't care. The music drew me onward, a beacon of vibrant sound in a world of muted tones. The source, I discovered, was a small room labeled Staff Lounge. Peeking through the slightly ajar door, I beheld a sight that transfixed me. A group of nurses and a few orderlies, all uniformed like Sarah, were gathered around a small, rectangular device. Their faces, usually placid and professional, were alive with genuine emotion. Some smiled, some swayed gently to the music, and a few brushed away what my ocular sensors identified as tears. This. This was a byproduct of food? It held an almost mystical power over these creatures, touching them in a way I hadn't yet witnessed. The mission objective, once so clear-cut, seemed to ripple and distort before my eyes. How could a species capable of generating emotions this profound, through music of all things, be merely a potential source of leverage? One night, as the rhythmic lullaby of heartbeats and oxygen hisses lulled the staff into a false sense of security, I acted. Slipping out of my room, I let my form ripple and flow, not into a fully human shape, but something in between, limbs leaner, eyes subtly shifting for better night vision. Even my gait changed, less an awkward bipedal shuffle and more of a fluid, silent glide. The corridors lay in shadow, and I moved like a creature of the night, a predator disguised as prey. Every instinct honed during missions of interstellar espionage flared back to life. The goal wasn't simply to reach the cafeteria, but to do so undetected. The air grew thick with tantalizing scents as I neared the target, it wasn't the harsh chemical smells of the ward, but something richer, a complex tapestry of aromas that made my simulated stomach churn in anticipation. Pushing through the double doors, I entered the heart of the beast. The cafeteria was a cavernous space, dimly lit and eerily deserted. 
But it was the surfaces, the gleaming metal counters, the humming machines, the tray stacked haphazardly, that drew my attention. These were the tools of their food creation. Every inch sang with residual energy, the lingering traces of a thousand culinary transformations. I had to sample these sources themselves. Guided by smell, I slunk towards a large metal container brimming with dark liquid. The scent was both familiar and utterly alien, a heady mix of bitterness and something akin to fermented fruit. Coffee, my human memory dredged up the name. Cupping my hands, I brought the liquid to my lips. The taste was an explosion on my tongue, a burst of intense bitterness followed by an odd, lingering warmth. My insides recoiled, then settled, not unpleasantly. Was this part of it? The pleasure humans derived? I drank more, a primal thirst compelling me. Suddenly, a flicker of movement in the corner of my vision snapped me back to the reality of my mission. A figure stood near the doorway, shrouded half in shadow. Perhaps another late-night wanderer drawn by the tantalizing smells, or a guard alerted by my intrusion. My human guise would be useless this close. There was no time to retreat. With the speed that had served me well in past missions, I launched myself forward, my form shifting as I moved. Limbs lengthened, hardened, claws emerged, I was no longer John Doe, but a predator designed for survival. The figure reacted with surprise, a cry echoing in the vast space of the cafeteria. But whether it was a call for help or a shriek of terror, I did not wait to find out. The shadows offered cover. With a final burst of speed, I slipped past the stunned human, disappearing into the labyrinth and hospital corridors. Mission status, severely compromised. Leverage, still a tantalizing unknown. But a new imperative burned within me, not mere survival, but a desire to unravel the mysteries of this strange, delicious, and emotionally potent world called Earth. And strangely enough, that desire, ignited by the taste of a simple bitter brew, felt even stronger than the Grand Commander's orders. In the days following my chaotic cafeteria raid, the hospital staff became a skittish flock of birds, startled by every stray shadow. My supposed amnesia was largely forgotten, replaced by hushed whispers of the creature lurking within their walls. Yet, no heavily armed teams came storming my room, no soldiers of this world hauled me away in chains. It seemed my hasty retreat had left more confusion than concrete evidence. Was I a figment of a coffee-addled employee's imagination? Perhaps a clever escapee from the psych ward? The human capacity for rationalizing away the inexplicable was truly a wonder to behold. This unintentional chaos served as the perfect cover. The John Doe persona was discarded, no longer a shield but a liability. Instead, I became a ghost haunting the hospital's underbelly. Air vents, forgotten supply closets, the maze of pipes beneath their gleaming floors, these were my new domains. My form, now permanently shifted into something lithe and vaguely canine, let me move with silent grace in this human warren. The hunger drove me. No longer mere curiosity, it was a gnawing ache in the very core of my being. Replicating the human digestive system had been a painful necessity, now it was an agonizing curse. Their foods. They weren't merely sustenance. Each bite, each stolen scrap, was a detonation of my senses. Sweet, salty, sour, textures and temperatures and combinations so utterly foreign to my Zygorian experience, yet I craved them relentlessly. The simple potato, boiled and salted, it was a revelation. An entire bag vanished in minutes, my hunger finally abating, however briefly. It was shameful, yet I could not stop. The thrill of the hunt became part of the addiction. One night, it was a tray of half-eaten dinners, left carelessly outside a quarantined room. Another, a raided vending machine, the crinkle of wrappers echoing far too loudly in the silence. Survival was no longer the sole motivator. Each pilfered bite was like deciphering a line of code in this bizarre symphony of flavor the humans generated. I started sensing patterns. Certain flavor combinations sparked bursts of energy, others a strange lethargy. Some, when coupled with particular music, made everything brighter, sharper, the heartbeat of the hospital pulsing in time with a symphony of taste. Music remained an enigma, yet my craving for it mirrored my hunger for food. Hiding within the walls, I became an unseen audience to the staff's lounge concerts. Once I risked peering within, drawn by a melody that made my stolen coffee taste like molten starlight. The sight was jarring, nurses swaying together, tears streaming down their faces, smiles tinged with an impossible joy. How could a species consumed by such rich emotions be a mere pawn? The Zygorian concept of leverage, cold and tactical, suddenly felt flimsy. I had stumbled into a world teeming with complexities my mission hadn't even begun to address. 
Then came the night the music changed. A new staff member, a young man named Ethan, sat at the battered piano that usually served as a centerpiece for sing-alongs. The sounds he coaxed from it weren't joyful, but mournful, a haunting melody that made some weep, while in others it sparked a flicker of sharp defiance. Driven by an instinct I didn't understand, I followed Ethan when he left. He didn't go to the brightly lit parking lot, but a dingy side alley, lit by a flickering lamp. There, slumped against a brick wall, I found him sobbing, the music still humming from the phone clutched in his hand. I should have retreated, my presence a threat to everything I'd built. But I was no longer simply Zyrth, Zygorian shapeshifter. I was a creature forged in a hospital cafeteria, fueled by stolen sweets and human sorrow. My form melted, shifting until it roughly resembled his own. This wasn't out of empathy, but a hunter's instinct, to close the distance, to become part of his world. When he finally looked up, eyes red and streaked with tears, his gasp of shock was the most human sound I'd ever heard. The encounter with Ethan was a turning point, a catalyst I scarcely understood myself. The shared moment of raw human emotion, something my kind never outwardly displayed, had bridged a gap I hadn't known existed. No longer merely observing, I was becoming irrevocably entangled. The humans of the hospital began to acquire individual shapes in my mind. Sarah, with her kind eyes and gentle worry, forever linked to my first taste of ice cream, a stolen cup of hospital vanilla, shockingly cold yet inexplicably soothing. Dr. Howard, blustery and slightly overweight, now represented by the succulent roast chicken I pilfered from his lunch tray, the mingling of herbs a taste explosion worthy of Zygorian royalty. My mission morphed. Food, it became clear, was the key to understanding this world. It was fuel, medicine, ritual, weapon, a universal language built on flavors. So, I began to gather. Not data, not intel, but physical samples. Each daring raid became a treasure hunt. A nurse's discarded muffin, a janitor's smuggled slice of pizza, cookies left as offerings on the desks of sleeping night shift workers. Every morsel was cataloged, dissected, its effects upon my morphing physiology meticulously noted. Accessing their internet had been laughably easy, but now it felt inadequate. Recipes were mere skeletons compared to the act of creation itself. I started to risk daylight forays, venturing into the small town surrounding the hospital. Their grocery stores were a bewildering cornucopia. Aisles bursting with colors and shapes undreamt on Zyger Prime. Transportation was the biggest hurdle. My Zygorian form, however well disguised, was unsuited for blending in amidst their vehicular traffic. The solution, as it often was for humans, was theft. An unlocked bicycle dash a strange contraption of metal and wheels, became my midnight steed, a laden backpack my spoils of war. The return to the transport vessel, buried deep within the woods surrounding Willow Creek, was a journey laced with unfamiliar guilt. I wasn't a conquering hero, more like a smuggler of contraband, ferrying my stolen bounty back to a world that wouldn't understand it. The reception from my fellow Zygorians was as I'd feared. No gleeful anticipation over hard-won intel, no awe at the potential leverage I'd uncovered. Instead, Grand Commander Orlik stared with barely concealed disgust as I unveiled my hoard. Wrinkled vegetables whose names I struggled to recall. Packets of brightly colored powders and pastes. Loaves of strangely soft, brown material labeled bread. To them, it was refuse. Less valuable than dirt. To me, it was the culmination of a transformation my own kind couldn't comprehend. This, I dared to speak, the words thick in my human mimic throat, this is the key. You want control over Earth? This is how you get it. Silence hung heavy in the briefing chamber. It took Orlik several moments to process my defiance. His voice, when it came, was like ice. Explain yourself, Zyrth. They don't fight over resources like we do, I began, the words spilling out of me, fueled by months of secret gluttony and a dawning understanding of the human heart. They fight over this. They mourn, they celebrate, they find purpose. All through this. A ripple of confusion, perhaps even fear, passed through the assembled shapeshifters. Never had one of our kind spoken of an alien species with anything but disdain. You believe power lies in. Bread? Orlix's voice raised a notch, disbelief dripping from the word. In pastry, I countered boldly, a spark of manic defiance rising within me in spices, and things that taste of sunlight and warmth and things I have no words for. You want to rule them? Learn this language. Become what they are, taste what they taste. Then, and only then, will you understand how to exploit their desires. 
The chamber erupted in furious hisses and clicking mandibles, the Zygorian equivalent of outrage. But Orlix held up a clawed hand, silencing them instantly. His multifaceted eyes bored into mine, calculating. You have become tainted, Zyrth, he pronounced, his disgust now thinly veiled. This obsession. It has corrupted your mission. It has enlightened me, I retorted, the tremble in my voice a mix of fear and exhilaration. I have found something you cannot comprehend within your sterile laboratories. Whether it was my audacity or the sheer absurdity of our situation, a flicker of something akin to amusement danced in Orlix's eyes. Very well, he declared. You believe these substances hold power. Prove it, Zyrth. Or face the consequences of your insubordination. I expected imprisonment, perhaps even the termination protocol for corrupted operatives. Instead, Grand Commander Orlik surprised us all. With an imperious flick of a clawed hand, he gestured toward the pile of stolen culinary treasures. Sample these. Concoctions, he ordered two of the larger shapeshifters. I will have their analysis. Thoroughly. The guards recoiled, their mandibles twitching with instinctive revulsion. Eating a substance unknown to Zygorian science was unheard of, potentially lethal. However, their ingrained obedience overrode their hesitation. Cautiously, they approached the pile, their forms shifting tentatively to replicate the tools I'd seen the humans use, forks, spoons, crude but effective appendages. My heart thrummed with a mix of anticipation and dread. This was madness, yet a terrifying part of me wanted, no, needed to see the effect my beloved food would have on my own kind. The first bite was a banana, bright yellow and slightly bruised. The shapeshifter seemed hesitant, then plunged the fork into its softness. As he lifted a morsel to his mouth, the tension in the chamber tightened to near breaking point. His reaction was unexpected. Not the convulsions or collapse we'd all been braced for, but a slow widening of his multifaceted eyes. A second morsel followed, then a third. He devoured the entire fruit with a speed that bordered on the primal. The second guard, less hesitant now, sampled a brightly colored paste I'd identified as strawberry jam. His response was even more dramatic. A shudder rippled through his massive bulk, and a low rumble that might have been a moan escaped him. Orlix observed all of this with unsettling calm. Report, he barked, his voice tinged with the faintest hint of curiosity. Sweetness, the first guard managed, a dazed look in his eyes. A sensation unlike any we've cataloged. It produces. A pleasant effect. The other chimed in, his voice raspy. A, a desire to consume more. The chamber echoed with a ripple of astonishment, a wave of dissonant hisses among the shapeshifters. Orlix rose from his command throne, his movement slow and deliberate. He circled the meager feast I'd assembled, his every sense attuned to the lingering aromas. Zyrth, his voice was barely above a whisper, yet it silenced the room. You have, inadvertently, stumbled upon something extraordinary. A surge of vindication coursed through me. I had been right. I glimpsed a power, a potential that my whole species had blindly overlooked. Their food, Orlix continued, is not merely sustenance. It alters. He gestured towards the guards, now eyeing the remaining scraps with a newfound hunger. It evokes a spectrum of reactions we barely comprehend. He fixed me with his unnerving stare. Your mission is not a failure, Zyrth. It has simply evolved. We will return to the blue planet. Not in conquest, but in observation. Your obsession, he paused, the words seeming to leave a bitter taste in his mouth, will be our greatest asset. The Zygorians shifted around me, their collective intent no longer hostile but crackling with a predatory hum. This was my triumph, yet it chilled me. With food. With flavor. Had I just unleashed a hunger in my own kind more dangerous than anything Earth could conceive? We need. Specialists, Orlix mused aloud. Scientists, tacticians, shapeshifters with Zyrus' unique skill set. This knowledge, he swept the room with his gaze, is the key to a dominion more complete than we ever imagined. He looked at me then, and I felt the true weight of my new role. You will lead, Zyrth. Teach us to hunger, as the humans do. My transition from outcast to vanguard was swift and brutal. The same Zygorian scientists who'd prepared me for my initial mission now reverse-engineered my physiology, analyzing every change the Earth food had wrought within me. Their laboratories, once sterile and focused on hard data, now hummed with the chaotic energy of a culinary experiment gone cosmically wrong. 
A small squad of shapeshifters was placed under my command, their forms morphing and twisting under the scientists' relentless prodding. These were not the hardened warriors I'd envisioned leading back to Earth, but pale imitations of human chefs, bakers, and farmers. We smelled of yeast instead of ozone, stained our claws with berry juices instead of engine lubricant. The Zygorians adapted, fueled by a new insatiable curiosity, but I sensed an undercurrent of resentment in their midst. Our transport vessel was refurbished, not with weaponry, but with sensor arrays designed to pinpoint the epicenters of human flavors, and holding pods filled with precious soil samples I'd risked my life to gather. As for my own diet, it was strictly controlled. My beloved Earth treats were now rationed, studied, their effects on my Zygorian form calibrated into precise doses meant to enhance my understanding of taste rather than overwhelm me with it. The return voyage to Earth was strangely subdued. There were no triumphant war cries, no battle plans discussed, merely a tense thrum of anticipation. Our landing was swift and precise, not in the remote field but amidst a vast expanse of cultivated farmland, chosen via analysis of Earth's satellite imagery. The rich loam, bursting with unknown biological potential, clung to our landing gears as we emerged into the humid air. Orlix remained on Zyger Prime, a remote overseer issuing commands and analyzing the constant stream of data we transmitted. Instead, it was I who led my strange band of mutated shapeshifters into this new stage of our mission. Disguises were perfected meticulously, no longer the simplistic mimicry of basic human shapes, but the finer details that gave us access to their culinary secrets. We infiltrated not hospitals or government centers, but kitchens, markets, and the fields themselves. I saw my fellow shapeshifters transform from cold-eyed soldiers into beings gripped by obsessions they barely understood. One became enthralled with the fiery heat of strange peppers, his form shifting to withstand the burn. Another developed an uncanny sense for the readiness of a fruit, knowing the exact moment of peak sweetness. It was a bizarre yet potent army. We understand the product, I reported back to a skeptical Orlix during one of our communications. But replication? That is the true challenge. He scoffed at that, clinging to Zygorian arrogance, but I'd begun to see the cracks in our superiority. And then, the twist none of us, not even me, had seen coming. It started subtly, a lingering fragrance in the air that carried a hint of home, the sterile scent of Zygorian laboratories mingled with something sweet and familiar. Following the scent, we found it, a patch of the farmland, seemingly undistinguished, yet buzzing with an intense energy that crackled against our skin. Pushing closer, we saw it, sprouts of a pale green plant with strangely lobed leaves. The closest our database could match it to was an earth plant named basil. But it was wrong, subtly but critically different. The leaves shimmered with a faint luminescence under the night sky. I plucked one, the scent intensifying. Crushing it released a smell so potent it made several of my shapeshifters recoil. Yet, in that overpowering aroma, I recognized the unmistakable, the sharp tang of Zygorian energy rations, the base nutrient we subsisted on. Earth, I breathed, staring at the glowing foliage, my multiple hearts thundering in my chest. It's... it's adapting. The implications were staggering. We come here to pillage their secrets. Had we, instead, inadvertently triggered an evolutionary arms race within their very ecosystem? Had our presence, our hunger for their delicacies, inadvertently created a countermeasure? A foodborne weapon blooming unnoticed right under our claws?